So how does this work in the real world? To give you an idea and a metric to be able to conceptualize this, the most productive ecosystems in the world produce about 2,200 grams of dry biomass per square meter per year. That's about 22 tons of carbon per hectare per year. I mean, not carbon, but uh, biomass on a per, acre, per hectare. You can see, with all we do in agriculture, with the irrigation, with the fertilization, we're only netting about 650 grams. Nobody's fertilizing the rainforest, and yet they can outperform us even with all we do. What I've been promoting at New Mexico State University is a biologically enhanced agricultural management or a beam approach, where I'm taking a soil, I'm inoculating it with, this, with the compost that we make at about four to 500 pounds per acre. And now we, we found a little better way to do it now where we can coat the seeds and plant them in. And I'll show that to you later here. But we've observed that we can move that productive capacity up to 1,980 grams in our transitional soils. In an advanced beam, we produced up to 4,279. So we've surpassed the most productive e ecosystems in the world just using biology. No fertilizers, no anything else. Now water is not a variable in this. It definitely affects your productivity. But at this point, what you want is an efficient system. You want that system ready to go when you do get the water you get. So you get the most production out of that water. You don't want it back in that three to 17% range because even if you do get the rain, you're not going to get the productivity. This ends up to be about 10.7 tons carbon per hectare per year that we're increasing the soil carbon at. This rate is about 19.2 metric tons of carbon per hectare per year. This is one of our treatments. Um, for one year, we practiced beam on this. And this is our control. We planted a cover crop at the same time. It all got irrigated, irrigated at the same time. You can see five tons production on that after one year to one ton production on this plot. This is that same plot. Uh, this is May of 2016. We're able to produce 881 grams of dry biomass per square meter. That was about 264 pounds of nitrogen per acre that we had fixed in plant biomass just in above ground plant material. You also have about the same amount below ground as you saw on the greenhouse test. This is that same one in a, uh, our summer cover. It was a soybean, it was a uh, sesbania, and a sunflower mix. For June 23rd, it was about four to five inches tall. 29 days later, it was six feet. Now realize that black oil seed sunflower is normally grows about four to five feet high, and the heads on it are usually about five to six inches. This was about 13 days later. You can see, the heads are as big as mine, or bigger, and it was a little over seven feet tall. This is a sesbanya crop. I've seen this in your fields as we were driving in. and didn't realize you had it in Australia. Uh, the first season we grew it, using this beam process, was four feet tall. The second season we grew it, it was six feet tall. And the third season we grew it, it was 12 feet tall. All along this process of employing beam, or improving the biology in the soil, and keeping a cover crop on this land all the time to capture the energy that it needed to feed the microbes, shows you how much you can improve a soil. The sesbania is a legume, as you probably know, so it does nodulate, but it also associates with mycorrhizae. You can see a whole tuft of mycorrhizae that have surrounded that root. I'm also employing this in the pecan orchards that we have in Las Cruces. We have some, of the, used to be some of the largest ones in the world, till y'all took that away from us. 
Thank you. <laughs> There's lots of issues in growing pecans in our area. You get a lot of soil compaction, and most of them are adding chemicals, their soils. They're having to go out now with excavators and dig six and seven feet down into the soil and pick it up and fluff it up and pack it back down again to get water to percolate through. In some of the areas, after an irrigation, the water will stand over a week. So this is applying beam into these orchards will start to open that soil up and allow that water to infiltrate in and also start to restore the uh, nutrient availability of that soil. As you can see, this is a half year beam and the plant growth for the sunflower, two and a half years, and after six years. You see definite changes in the productive capacity of the soil. This is cotton in our area. Uh, this is conventional, 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre. This is beam transitioning after one and a half years. It was over twice the growth of the plant plus twice the number of bolts. What we've seen in cotton production with, it, with beam is a 59% increase in productivity. Chili production, a 98% increase. So this would say to me, you can grow the same amount of crop on half the land, so you would use only half the water. So this would be a water conservation measure, seeing that you use water more efficiently to grow a plant. This is our four and a half year on our transitional beam. We started out about 0.43% soil carbon. And through this, these four and a half years, we've increased it up to about 1.45. This is a rate of increase, so a carbon percent increase of 0.24%. Again, that 10.7 metric tons, or once you convert, as Terry was talking about, from carbon to CO2, you triple, 3.6 times this would be the amount of CO2 that you're sequestering. That is what you'll be selling on the market. I'm not the only one that's seeing this. If you, I guess some of you know, Gay Brown came through recently. This is 20 years of his data and his changes in his management from no-till, changing crop diversity, cover crops. At this point, he changed to multi-species cover crops and also livestock integration. That first 13 years was difficult. You can see he only put carbon in at a rate of 0.11% carbon increase per year. That is about 4.86 tons of carbon per hectare per year. Once he reached 3% soil organic matter, the system, the dynamics changed. You can see the slope that he achieved on that for his rate of soil carbon percent increase went up to 0.56, five times what he saw in that first 13 years. But he had to get to that 3% soil organic matter to get that going. This is what I'm observing in my research. I started at 0.43 and I'm up to his in what, about five, six years on that one. So the rate that we're, he's seeing increase, I'm seeing that also in mine. In my advanced beam, I'm seeing 0.51. He's seen 0.56. So we're pretty similar in that respect. And this data was taken by NRCS in cooperation with Gabe. I also started a desert plot. Uh, the plot at Landecker. Yes, ma'am. That's. And it looks like we can just inoculate the seed and put it in and you use very little. I'll show you that in a minute. But yes, yeah, uh, the compost, we need to look at it not as a nutrient or a nutrient amendment, but as an inocula, how we're building the soil up. And if anybody does have questions as we go along, please feel free. You know. In the uh, plot I had at the University Research Center, in that one, I'm putting everything back. I wanted to see how fast we can increase the soil carbon. 
This is a desert plot where I did just the opposite. As I grow these cover crops, I'm cutting them, hauling them off. Basically, this is a farming situation where you're harvesting everything that comes off of that soil. The first season of my cover crop that I grew was about 800 grams of dry biomass per square meter. The second season, we hit 1,608. The third season? I, you know, yes. Please, I, I just want to point out oh. to everyone. Yes. That's all in the background is what he's working on. This is our scenic area. There's no fertilizer going under any of these crops. It's only biology on that type of soil. So that's, I'm not really yeah. that they've really got that. Thank you. The third season that we grew the cover crop, 2,190 grams of dry biomass from square 583 pounds of nitrogen is what we've pulled out of the air, fixed into that above ground plant structure with a likely amount in the soil being the same. This is planted in November, and you don't get much growth over the winter because we have pretty cold winters. It starts to grow about mid-February. So this growth happens, you know, we harvest in 1st of May. This happens in 10 weeks. This amount of growth, equaling the most productive ecosystems in the world, happens in 10 weeks. This is a graph of what we've observed. These are the, the first year was 800 something, about 16, and then 2200. As you can see, my control plateaued in the soil. You can all see, without biology, you max out at about 2000. With biology, we're seeing 3,000 grams of dry biomass per square meter. When you normalize the production over those three years that we've had this going to the control, you're subtracting the amount of growth in the control from all the others, you can see the compost-treated soil, the inoculated soil, or bean, has a full year's productive capacity over all the others. Also did a humic acid treatment in there just to see how it functioned. But we also had another biologic, soil biology treatment. You can see not all soil biology treatments are good. It actually decreased OAP beyond the control. And this is the productivity of an of a agroecosystem as I showed you in that first chart. These are the changes in the soil profile in the control. The A horizon, or that, the darkened region, was only about two and a half inches. In the humic acids, it was four. In compost, we had six and a half inches. Now, the roots don't go much more than that. They stop there, but they stay within that, that biological area. And talking about the inoculation, was curious. A lot of people ask the same question you ask. Oh, what does it take? How much you have to put on there? Um, looking for an easier way to do this and to spread the compost further. I looked just recently at uh, my winter cover mix where I would inoculate the seed and I would inoculate some and dry them and I would inoculate others and plant them wet. Without any inoculation, I had an 80% germ. Dry germ was 90%. The wet was 100 percent. As you can see, I started this one eight days later than these other two. In between this, I'd gone to California uh, State University, Chico, and I'd always thought, you know, we're going to have to dry plant these, you know, just drill them in. But they are doing wet planting over there in California with their rice fields. So I came back, I started a wet treatment, as I say, eight and a half or eight days later, you can see it outgrew the dry treated, even though it's the same microbial community. On the Biomaster peas, without, again, 80% germ, the dry, 90%, and the wet was 100% germ. So evidently the microbes helped the plants germinate. We also saw more growth in the Cayuse oats, which is another part of this cover crop. Again, 80%, 90%, and 100%. So it's pretty consistent across the board. This is the inoculated, planted dry. You can see 
several nodules form. And what we noticed in the inoculated planting wet is we had aggregates of these nodes. And that happened not only in this one, but it also happened in the P, where we have nodulation up there for nitrogen fixation. And on this one, we had two aggregate. So there's another mystery here we have to solve. But when you put all this together, you look at the, the amount of biomass growth compared to the control. The field P on this one was 112% increase. On this other field P, 132% increase. And on the vetch, 128% increase. So we had greater biomass growth in three out of five of the seeds we tested, over 100%. We had faster growth. We had healthier looking plants and more extensive root systems. So as we shift the microbial community dynamics from bacterial to fungal dominance, we're observing we can increase the amount of carbon captured. We can see that we're also the amount of carbon going into the soil is increasing. This means nothing unless this system actually uh, slows down on the amount of respiration. Most all scientists are saying as you improve or increase soil carbon percent, you're going to increase respiration. In this same greenhouse test, add an 18 times increase in soil carbon mass. Of course, I did see an increase in respiration. But as you can see, it plateaued out. I had in a soil with 18 times increase in soil carbon mass over the experiment, only a four times increase in soil carbon respiration. When you look at this from the perspective of what percent of your original carbon in that soil gets respired? In a low fertility soil, bacterial dominant soil, 44% of that carbon gets respired. But as you increase the fertility of that soil, change the fungal to bacterial ratio, 11%. So this allows us to slow the flow of carbon out of the system. And the carbon use efficiency, what is happening to this carbon instead of it being respired, it's being turned into other microbes in the soil. This also happened in a field test I did for a year, 31 sample periods, looking at a desert soil, control, conventional, and advanced. Now remember, in the advanced, I had 7.6% carbon compared to, well, roughly one. So I had a seven times increase in soil carbon. I only had a doubling of respiration over that range. So soil microbial community dynamics is very important for carbon use efficiency. These are all of them put together, normalized to that productive, but you see a four to six times decrease in the relative CO2 respiration rates. Now as far as water holding capacity, we have very sandy soils in our area, in some cases. In this case, the first 1% increase in soil carbon quintuples the water storage capacity. Now you do have a maxima of about 100,000 gallons per uh, acre for the, in the top foot, but that first percent gives you so much as far as being able to infiltrate that water into the soil and hold it for the plant to use. Mm -hmm. You also see uh, this was the first 20 months of applying beam on one of my sample or one of my fields with five sampling periods. As far as the micronutrient uh, content of the soil, what we've seen in our agricultural systems as we add this nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, we are outstripping the ability of the microbial community that's there to harvest those minerals from the soil parent material. And so, during this process, we saw an increase in manganese 1100%, over 1,100%, as was iron here. 107% increase in nitrogen. Now remember, in this field, I'm not adding any fertilizers. I'm growing a plant, I'm chopping it, green chopping it, and I'm putting it back down. So there's no additions to this, but what the plants and the microbes bring to it. Magnesium, 83% increase in available magnesium. Calcium, 76%, phosphorus, 64%, zinc, 62%. So 
So this means that we can begin to restore the fertility of our soils and get these micronutrients back into our food. As far as comparing my system to others, West, in his study with 67 long-term no-till studies, concluded he could capture 0.57 tons carbon per hectare per year. Nigley, agroecosystems where they're doing uh, intensive mulching, 0.2 tons carbon per hectare per year. Law, and what he's looking at is arable cropping systems, he's estimating 0.7. In the four and a half years, or six years I've been doing this, I've averaged 10.7 tons carbon per hectare per year, and in the advanced beam, up to 19.2.